Okay, so uh, hi everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Now, uh, for the console, we are trying now a different path, which is through VPN. So you can add, we have now installed the, uh, the software in three different computers. And I will be sending after the class a clear instruction how to access the, uh, the VPN. Okay, so you don't need to install because it seems that there was some misunderstanding between, between me and console. It, it, you cannot install the software. Okay, so, but you would be able to access the software uh, remotely through VPN connection. So hopefully this time it will work. So I will be sending you the email after the after I finish the class, and hopefully I, I will get some good news from you guys. I will uh, also CC the TA uh, Abdullah. Abdullah took uh, a course through VBN before. He's my grad student. He's the TA for this course, and he has experience with the VBN connection. If you have any any issues, okay. So I, I'm hoping now we can sort this out. Okay, so that is for the uh, for the project. For the term paper, I will be updating uh, the uh, the term paper uh, request or details. I will give some more details about number of pages of the report. Uh, some of you requested that, how many pages, uh, the presentation time, all these regulations. I will uh, update the document that I posted for the term paper, and hopefully I will can do that today as well. So that is for the announcement. Any concerns, anything about the course before we start? Okay, good. So let me share my screen now. So the uh, topic that we'll discuss today is about a uh, high voltage uh, measurement and high current measurement as well, but concentration more on the on the high voltage. Now, in the previous lecture, we talked about high voltage generation, and we said that okay, this is needed for what? Because we have to test to test the equipment that we have before we send it to the customer to the clients. We have to they have to withstand different tests. One of them is the is the high voltage test. We have to test the integrity of the insulation. And depending on several factors, we have AC, we have DC, and we have impulse. And in the previous lecture, we talked about the generators, how they are designed, a little bit of uh, their characteristics, their limitations, and so on and so forth. Today, we'll talk about the second part of the testing pay, which is the measurement how we can measure this high voltages, because this is not like a simple high voltage. You can just bring a voltmeter and you go and bring the probe and you go and do the measurement. The, the voltages here are in kilovolts, sometimes in hundreds of kilovolts. So that is not possible. And also we'll talk about a little bit of the measurement of the, of the current. Now we have for the voltages we have AC, we have DC, we have impulse. And each one has its own uh, limitations, has its own problems uh, when, we, when it comes to the, to the measurement. Also, we want to uh, measure uh, currents, high currents. For some tests, we have very high currents. So also, we need to measure those, uh, those currents. Now, this measurement, for the, either for the voltage or for the current, uh, we have it uh, in uh, different aspects. We have it in the uh, basically in testing, high voltage testing, high voltage research as well, and high voltage uh, application. Now, the techniques, in essence, some of them are similar to the low voltage measurement. For example, the voltage divider. The voltage divider, as we know, let's say I want to measure 7, 800 volts. Okay, that is considered as a low voltage in the context of high voltage engineering. Now, my voltmeter can only measure, let's say 250 or 200 volts. That is the maximum RMS or this voltage it can take. Simply, we use a voltage divider, very simple. So we have here the voltage that I want to measure, it's either DC or AC. I have R1, I have R2, and this is the output voltage. And this is my V of the supply and me V out. 
is nothing but the supply times R1 over R1 plus R2. Now, by properly selecting R1 and R2, then you can reduce the voltage to the level that, that you want. So, this is one of the main ideas that we will be using to measure the, the high voltage. Now, because we are dealing with very high voltage, I cannot just simply bring any two resistors and connect them in series and apply the voltage division. Why is that? Because we need to have very large sizes of the electrode, for instance. When I do the connection between the high voltage and my divider, this has to be, I should have very, very large size. Why? Because if I use sharp points, if I use uh, electrodes with a small radius of curvature, at the tip of those electrodes, you will have corona. And also you might have a flashover as well. So it's very, very important to increase the size of the voltage divider. Yes, in essence, it's a voltage division, but in practice, there are more than that, and this will lead to some challenges. One of the challenges is the straight capacitance. What is a straight capacitance? What is a capacitance? Whenever you have uh, two conducting paths with different potentials, between them, there is a dielectric material that is a stray capacitance. Now, when you have very, very high voltage at certain places, and in other places you have a ground, you have air in between, then this is considered as a stray capacitance. The stray capacitance has certain issues that we'll talk about them, especially when you measure certain type of, of signals. Also, because the, the probes or the dividers will be large in size, then they act sometimes like antenna, they big noise from the surrounding. So that is also something that we have to work on and we see how we can uh, minimize, minimize this. So we'll start with the most fundamental technique to measure high voltages, okay, uh, using spark gaps. There are different types of the spark gap, but the whole idea here, we have two electrodes at two different potentials, and we know in advance that the voltage will break in air at a specific voltage. So once the voltage breaks, then I know how much voltage has been, has been applied. So basically here, this is just a disruptive discharge. So you have two electrodes, one electrode here, one electrode there, one is grounded, one you apply high voltage to it. And you know that for this configuration, that the breakdown happened at certain voltage. So whenever a flashover happens, then you will know that what was the voltage you have applied. So there is no direct measurement. It is just when you see the breakdown, you know what was the, the voltage that has been applied? Now, the source, because you are measuring from the source, and this is an arc, it's like a short circuit, then you, it has to be able to withstand several transients, because as we will see, usually we repeat the tests to make sure that the, the results are repeatable, and you take the average of this. So a couple of times, there will be like every time, you increase the voltage until a flashover happens and you record the value at which the flashover happens, you are creating a transient, you are creating an arcing. So then you have to, to uh, the supply should be able to withstand those transients. Okay, and the current, the short circuit current is high. Okay, so we have a requirement that the supply should be able to supply those uh, those short circuit currents. Now, these techniques or the spark gap are good for calibration purposes. So usually we don't have, for example, at the inverse of water law, we don't have the spear gaps as a technique to measure the high voltage. But calibration labs, for example, if you wanna calibrate your measurement system, or you wanna calibrate how much coming out of your transformer, then you use this, this calibration 
or those spark gaps, just to tell you that, okay, the voltage that you are measuring is, is actually the same value you are, you are expecting. So hence, it will just tell you what is the voltage. You cannot measure the waveform. So we'll see, for example, starting from next week, when, when we talk about testing of equipment, let's say the transformer, and we subject the transformer to, let's say, switching and lightning surge, I need to measure the signal for a purpose we'll talk about later on. But with this technique, you cannot. You just, you will know the big value. So that is just a measurement for the big value. There are three different main types of arrangement for the, the spark gaps. We have the sphere gaps, the road gaps. Now the road gaps, you will have an inhomogeneous field. The sphere gaps, you will have more of a uniform field. And finally, you will have actual uniform fields and we can use different uh, profiles uh, to give us this uh, uniform uh, field. We will see the pros and cons of each one, but the most common one is the sphere gaps. So the sphere gaps is basically the most common one. So this is how it look like. So we have two spheres here, one sphere through, a, this is a resistance, we talk about it, why we have this resistance, connected through a resistance to the high voltage supply, okay? And the other sphere is connected to the ground. So here we have a ground connection. Here we have high voltage. And this distance between the two electrodes is adjustable here. If you look down here, there is, it could be motorized or could be manually controlled. So this gap, I control it. This is a gap that we control, okay? And as I mentioned, okay, you control. So once you, for certain gap, for certain radius of the sphere gap, you will have the breakdown voltages. And we'll see that this is given in certain standard tables. Okay, so that whenever a flash over happens here, then you know that basically the, that what was the voltage that has been, has been applied. So this technique is very, very old, more than 100 years. And it is not common, as I mentioned earlier, it's not commonly used in labs, but it is used in the standard lab. For example, here in Canada, we have the NRC, the National Research Council, and there we have the metrological labs. So those labs are used to calibrate the equipment. So those labs, they maintain those field gaps. Okay? But for a regular lab, no, we don't have. If you are not doing calibration, we don't use these, uh, these gaps. So basically these, as I mentioned, these are a uh, peak voltage measuring devices. So you are only measuring the peak value, the peak of the sinusoidal, the magnitude of the DC, of the peak of the, of the impulse. So this technique can be used to measure any type of voltages, AC, DC, or, uh, or switching uh, and lightning or impulse, impulse uh, voltages. So it can be used to uh, use different types of uh, of uh, voltage waveforms. The major advantage of this also, and this is why we use it for calibration, it is immune to electromagnetic interference. Now, you'd see that other types of measurement systems, they are not immune from electromagnetic interference. So this uh, interference from electromagnetic waves around us, it will give a distortion uh, or it will distort the measured waveforms. But this one, as I said, you don't measure any waveform. It is basically you apply the voltage. You expect that the breakdown will happen at certain voltage, and then you will see between what you are applying and at what voltage the breakdown has actually actually occurred. Now there are certain rules here. For example, that the distance between the gap should be less than the sphere radius. So this gap, we'll call it B should be less than the radius R. And the reason for that, if this becomes larger than the radius R, you will have a very, very large uh, air gap and the electricity become completely non-uniform and it becomes like a point electrode and then, then you cannot control the voltage at which the breakdown will happen. So you keep this condition so that you have sort of uh, repeated, repetitive results. 
or reproduce the results. Also, the sphere radius, which is R here in millimeter, should be at least equal to the measured voltage in kilovolt. So it depends on how much voltage you are measuring. Then you have to still make the radius that, so as you increase the voltage that you want to measure, you will increase the radius of the of the sphere as we will as we'll see later later on. Now, as I said, now you apply a voltage here. This is a high voltage until an arc happens. So what will limit the arc? You have to have something to limit the arc. Otherwise, the energy from this supply can damage the sphere. Okay. So to do that, we use a limiting resistance, which is this one. We use a limiting resistance to limit the the amount of of a uh, high voltage that you can you can apply okay so this is extremely important to apply to have this uh, limiting uh, resistance now the sphere it has to be smooth and usually whenever there is a flash over there then you start to have like a sort of a rough surface now why the rough surface is bad and why we need to have a, a smooth surface now if you go try to look here under the microscope, so you'll have the top sphere and the bottom sphere. Okay, so that is a sort of a uniform uh, field here in between, and the arcing will happen between these two points, between the say point A and point B, the closest two points to each other. Now, once you start to have a surface that is not smooth, a surface like this, for example, because now you have too many arcing happens you start to damage the surface then when you energize the system then those will start to initiate random flash overs because those is those will initiate corona because of the sharp point and the sharp point could be also at the high voltage side not just necessarily on the ground so those sharp points now will start to trigger the flash over at a value which is not really what you predict. It's not predictable value. And you don't want that. You want to have the surface to be very, very smooth so that you can control. And the voltage that you are getting basically is, is a control voltage and it's not something that is random. It happens at different points. So to, to avoid any issues, so polishing is usually done. When you polish the surface, to remove any sort of irregularities, any sharp edges, any sharp points on the surface of the of the sphere. Okay. Now, if you have a long gap, because you want to measure now higher voltage, or you want to do an impulse measurement, then we need to have a source to provide electrons to reduce the st statistical time lag. Now, we need to understand what do we mean by this. Now, when you apply uh, long road, okay, we have the distance between the road is large, or you apply an impulse. Now, when you apply an impulse, the voltage stays for a short period of time. The time that the voltage is applied is short. We said that, for example, if you are measuring lightning impulse, so this is the rise time is 1.2 to 50 microseconds. It's a very short period of time. Now, the flashover that happens between the two spheres in air, it is a statistical process. And whenever you have a sort of uh, uniform electric field, you have what we call Townsend, Townsend mechanism. Now, these things are not discussed in this course. There is another course called the electric course. We discuss the mechanism of flashover in the fields there. But in, in principle, you need to have an electron in the gap, and that electron would start to get energized and getting high energy because of the high electric field. So it will start moving down, and then as it move, it start to hit different atoms and start to uh, release more and more electrons. So we'll have, each one will release an electron. We have an exponential increase until we have a flash over. But you have to have an electron, okay? Now, when you apply short pulses, you might have the pulses go and come back and, and finish 
and this electron doesn't exist. It's not there. It's not there. So you need to create that electrons. And this is why you have to have a source inside the sphere to provide those electrons. Now, when you provide this electron, you are sort of assurance that you will have an electron to start the avalanche and the break breakdown. But we need that whenever we want to measure impulses or we want to uh, measure uh, voltages at long distances. Now, for AC and DC, what we, how we measure the voltage, we increase the voltage gradually, okay, until flash over happens. Then we do three measurements and we do, if the measurements are within the 3%, they should be within the 3%. There should be no large scatter because if you have large scatter, it means you have something wrong either in the gap arrangement or in the surface or in uh, the environment around you. And we'll talk about some of them as, as we progress. So this is very important to make sure that the results, the scatter in the results is not uh, high, more than 3%. So once you are done with three results, you take the average and this will be the, the reported value. Now for the impulse, we use a normal distribution. Uh, we assume a normal distribution and we use the 50% breakdown probability. And I will talk about that next class in details. What do we mean by the 50% breakdown probability? We will use that when we talk about testing of insulators. Uh, I will mention that in details. Now, when a breakdown happens, it's a function not just in the space between the electrodes, not just the, uh, the type of electrode, the sphere radius, of course, these are all important. And these factors, you have them in a table. However, there are certain other factors can influence your flashover, like humidity, like pressure, like temperature. All these factors can uh, impact your voltage level at which the breakdown happens. So it's very important to apply certain correction. Otherwise, you will do a test today at certain temperature, certain humidity, certain pressure, and then you do this after a week or after a couple of days, you get totally different results, although everything is is the same from the physical structure. Your electrode doesn't change, your voltage doesn't change, so the gap doesn't change. Why is that? Because you are not controlling these factors. So these factors are somehow hard to control, then you have to apply a correction factor. And I will talk about this correction, correction factor. Now let's look here to the sphere gap. These are vertical sphere gaps. And let's have some look here. So that this is a vertical sphere gap, okay? And we have sphere, this is the sphere. So this is the first sphere, and this is the second. So this is sphere number one, connected to the high voltage. And this is connected to the ground. This is the sphere number, number two, okay? And this is the gap. S is the gap between sphere number, uh, gap, uh, sphere number uh, one and sphere number Number two. Now, here on top of the uh, of your uh, electrode, you have a sphere shank. So this this part is a metallic part connected to the sphere. And at the bottom here, we have the operating gear number three. So that gear is basically could be, as I said, manual, could be uh, motorized to move up and down the sphere so that you can come up with specific specific distance. And then we have here the high voltage connection through the uh, series resistor to limit the, uh, the, high, the, the high voltage, uh, basically uh, current when you have a flash over. And then you see here, this is the stress distributor. This is another metallic structure, but with a larger radius than the shank. And this is the control the electric field around it so that there will be no corona around uh, around the, the structure because you don't want to have 
any corona around the the electrode you have you want to have a flash over only but you don't have to to have any corona so this is why we need to use a, a larger uh, uh, a larger uh, radius so that you can have a better uniform uh, uniform electric field now let's look to a a is the height of b so this is this height from at point the lowest point here this is where you will have the sparking point this habit between these two points to the ground so that is the the, the height a and b is the radius around the electrode system, and in that radius, you should not have any object. Because the moment you start to have an object here inside, you will have some induced voltage, especially if it is metallic, or even if it's an insulation, it will accumulate certain charges, and then you will have a steady capacitance. And that can affect the accuracy of your results. So in that sphere, B, you do, should not have any object between the high voltage setup system and the uh, any 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 surrounding. So you see the walls here are far away from that from that radius. This is very similar, but this is a, a horizontal. So that is a vertical one. This is a horizontal one. And now here we have the, the support. Okay, this is the these are the two spheres here. And here between point B and A, this is the distance A. And this is the sphere B, which is basically uh, the region uh, that you are not allowed to have any object close to the, to the high voltage. And here is your uh, sphere shank. This one, this is a sphere shank connected to, the, connected to your, uh, your uh, sphere. And this is number three. And this is the three. These are to the operating gears, so you can move the both spheres from both both direction. Now here is the table for you. That is the one that you will have. So let's see here. So here, this is the sphere gap spacing. So the sphere gap, this gap is in this table. In in, in here. 5 10 15 until 250 so let's let's look that let's look to to this part of the table to the left part i will come to the right part then we have sphere diameters in centimeters 6.25 12.525 centimeters so that is the radius of your sphere now here is the breakdown voltage this is the peak voltage rms or dc that which you will have uh, your breakdown habit okay so if you have let's say uh, a sphere radius of 12.5 and the sphere gap is 25 millimeter then you will have a breakdown voltage at 72.5 so the voltage that you are measuring there Basically, it, ha it happens around 72.5. If you want to calibrate your, your system, you will see how far the dial that you have in your instrument or in your system than the actual, the actual value. This is how you can, uh, you can calibrate. Now, this table is also, it's the same like this table, the right one. But now here we have larger sphere diameters to measure larger and larger voltages you can measure here thousands hundreds of kilovolts and thousands of kilo kilovolts as well now as i mentioned here there is a correction factor for the air density air density change with pressure with temperature so this is the voltage to be measured this is the voltage that you are you will, you will measure this is what you are supposed to to measure uh, okay Riza, you have a question yeah, it, uh, yes, please. If you go back to the, the previous slide, what are those numbers in the bracket? What's that? The, the numbers uh, inside the brackets. Oh, those numbers? Yeah. As far as I know that you are not recommended to do this. You can do the measurements, but it's better to use a higher 
uh, sphere uh, uh, diameter. For example, here, uh, it, at this one, you will get these values, but it is better to do it at these values. That is as far as remember, but I can check this one. Okay, thanks. Okay. Uh, as you can see here, as you increase, now you are fixing the sphere gap. Okay. So the sphere gap has been fixed 35. If you go this way, as you increase the radius of your sphere, you are having higher and higher voltages. Because as you increase the sphere diameter, you are getting more and more uniform field. Uniform field, the breakdown happens at a higher voltage level compared to the non-uniform field. So that's sort of not recommended. That is as far as I remember, but I, will, I, can, I can check that. Uh, this is not very highly recommended, so it's better to go for the bigger sphere gaps. And we said that there is a correlation or a rule of thumb between how much the breakdown voltage and what is the sphere radius should be. So there is a so sort of a uh, rule of thumb there. Thank you. Okay. So here, this is the voltage that you want to measure. And this is the voltage that you have from this table. So the voltage from the table and the voltage you are measuring, there is some discrepancy between them. Why? Because those voltages are taken at certain specific conditions. And I will come to these conditions. So if you change the temperature, if you change the pressure, then you will not, the voltage that you will be measuring would be different than this. So then you will have to have a correction factor. Now, this correction factor is related to the air density. Uh, air density is equal to P pressure T0 over P0 times T. Now, P and T are the values of the pressure and temperature at the test conditions. P0 and T0 are the values at the standard condition, the condition at which you are doing these, uh, these measurements in those, on those tables. So if you look here carefully, again, this formula here, Is the same as this formula. This is exactly the same formula. But now here the temperature are in Kelvin actually. So we are, we are adding the 273. We have P and T. P and T, these are the pressure and the temperature of the existing conditions. Now T0 and P0, P0 is 10, uh, 1.3 kilopascal and T0 is 20 degrees centigrade. So at that condition, you 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 we do pick our our measurement. Uh, this lambda is equal to is equal to one at sea level. So we look here. This is the relative air density that you calculate, and here is the correction factor that we have in this formula here. This is the correction factor. So based on the relative air density that you calculate, you select certain. Uh, correction factor, and then you multiply it by this, and that is the voltage that you're going to measure at that specific conditions. Now, the, as I said, the sphere gaps is the most common type uh, of uh, road gaps because it, it provides you of a very close to uniform electric field, and it is basically helps that you can get very good results out of this, okay? Now, this is the road gaps. Now we have, we apply the high voltage here and here's the ground. Now here we have roads, it's not basically spheres. So that's not a very standard way to measure the high voltage like the road gap. And it, it's not used for impulse because the scatter will be too much. If you use that for an impulse measurement, the scatter will be uh, very, very high. What do we mean by the scatter? It means that when you repeat the test, the uh, repeatability is not there because of the highly non-uniform field. And for an impulse, it is by itself, the impulse, because the impulse is not as the AC, because the impulse, you apply the voltage for a very short period of time. So you have to make sure that there are enough electrons there in the gap during that period to have the avalanche. 
but for the AC or for DC, the voltage stays there for a long time. So you don't have this issue as you have it in the impulse. Now, when the field is not uniform like this, the things becomes becomes worse. Now for AC and DC, the V out is equal to two plus 0.534 V. This is an empirical formula used to estimate the, the voltage at which a breakdown will happen. So it's equal to two plus 0.534 times D. D basically is between 250 millimeter to 2,500 millimeter. D is this distance. That is your, your D. And again, as I said, that is only used for AC and for, for DC uh, voltages. Now, uniform electric field. Now, we have different type of profile, like Rogowski, Bruce. Now, here we have something like this. Completely uniform electric field. The electric field in that region is, is constant here, or in X and in the Y uh, direction. And this one has the advantages that you will have very precise value. Okay? However, to adjust a line is not easy because at the end here, the field is not that uniform. So you want to make sure that you don't have any enhancement in the field on the sides so that you will have the breakdown happening at, at the side. This is why the sphere is, is much, much better. Also, the geometry is very hard to machine. To have a very nice profile parallel electrode is not easy to do. So this is why this is not really used much. Another way of measuring the voltage, okay, we use what we call the electrostatic voltmeter. Now, just if you, uh, this is a back, background, if I have two parallel plates, with a distance between the two plates equal to X and cross-sectional area is A. And here is air gap. So this is epsilon zero, epsilon R is equal to one. So the capacitance is equal to epsilon zero times the cross-sectional area divided by the distance X. The energy that's stored in the capacitor is equal to one half CV squared. This is the energy that we stored in any capacitor which is now I will take the C out and I substitute its, its value here. Just one half epsilon A over X V squared. Now the force is related because with the energy stored, which is basically the change, rate of change of the energy with respect to the distance, that is the energy, okay? So if you take the derivative here, you will get, this is the, the force. So here's the force and the voltage are related to each other. Now, this is for DC. If you apply uh, an AC, then you take the average of that, the mean value, which will take the one over T over the period F of T. Then this is also is equal to the, to the same value, but here is DC, here is RMS, RMS value. So here I relate the voltage with the, with the force. So if I can calculate the force, I can calculate the, the voltage. This is as simple as that. Now let's go to the arrangement here. We have the high voltage electrodes. So you apply the high voltage here. Here is the ground. And this is here a trapped disc. So when you apply a high voltage, there is a force. It is there. And this force will attract the disc to move toward it. So this disc will be moving because there is a force that happening there. Okay. Now, as the disc is moving up, the capacitance will be changing because X here will be actually changing. So the amount of energy that you are storing there is basically changing. And here there is a relationship between, as I've shown to you, between the force that we apply and the voltage, either DC or RMS value in that specific, specific uh, system. Now the measured voltage can be up to megahertz, but we cannot, increase the frequency more than that because the moment we start to increase the frequency you will start to have the stray capacitance between the different parts here and this will impact your your results so for a few megahertz that's okay but then after that you cannot use 
the uh, this system to measure that that voltages. So it's ideal for DC and for AC uh, system. Another way to measure the voltage here is indirectly by measuring the current. So we have a limiting resistance in the path of the high voltage, and we have an ammeter. Okay, so when you have this is your high voltage here. So this is a limiting resistance. It's a high voltage resistance. I will come to it. So you will have a current here I, and the current you are measuring it. So this R is known to you, and you are measuring the current. So knowing the current and the resistance, then the voltage here is basically I times R. Okay. So that is indirect way. So by measuring the current, basically you can find the the high uh, the high voltage. Now, this uh, resistance is made of a series. This is now R. This is R. So basically, they are small resistance. These are the small resistors. They are connected in series. So the total resistance here is the summation, is the summation of all these R primes. And to avoid any flash over inside, because you are applying high voltage here across the, the resistance. And this is here basically almost grounded because the internal impedance of the ammeter is very, very small. So that is almost is, is, is a ground. Okay. So you are applying the whole high voltage across your resistance. Okay. So if you have that high voltage, you might have some arcing inside the resistance. So we fill it with transformer oil to avoid any sort of uh, of arcing inside. Also, the height of your resistance, which is here, this is your height H, it is should be 0.25 centimeter for every kilovolt to avoid any flash over from the top to the bottom. So to avoid any flash over, you have to make sure that the, the, the resistance basically, uh, it is uh, uh, 0.25 centimeter every kilometer. Now, you look here at the top where you apply the high voltage. There is a metal cap here. Okay. And this metal cap is a smooth to smooth the surface here and to avoid any corona because this is high voltage. So you have to use a very, very small, uh, uh, sorry, very smooth electrode with no sharp points so that you avoid any corona on the, on the surface. Also, the value of the resistor we choose is so that to limit the current to below one milliamp. So the current here that goes is very, very small current, but we use a sensitive ammeter to be able to measure that, uh, measure that current. Now, why do we limit the current to, so that will prevent any increase in the temperature because this current has to go through the resistor. Okay? And there will be an I square R power loss. So if the current is high, that you will have here a high uh, sort of uh, high temperature inside them uh, and the resistance. And that's bad. Why is that? Now, yet the, the resistance value, if you increase the temperature, its value will increase. So when we say that if we have assumed value of R, that is at a specific temperature. Okay, But if you don't control the current, and the temperature of the resistance start to increase without any control, then this will lead to changing the value of the resistance to something that you don't know. You are assuming that the value of the resistance is this, but actually the value of the resistance will be something something different. Okay, so that's very very important to uh, to control. Now we have also. A protection device, which is basically a surge arrestor. Okay, so if, for example, there is a very high uh, current habit, a flashover habit, or something, then you want to uh, avoid the current to damage the ammeter. So basically, to protect that, we use a surge arrestor. The surge arrestor basically is a protective device against any surge. It impedance under normal voltages is very very high it acts like an open circuit 
But once there is a transient, it's a nonlinear resistance, it changes into a very small resistance and it will allow the energy coming from the current to be dissipated to the ground and hence you will avoid uh, any sort of damages to your, uh, to your emitter, which is usually the, the expensive one. So to protect that, we have this uh, device in parallel with the, with the emitter. Now, those, this type of device is not good to measure at high frequency. Again, because we have high strain capacitance. When you look, this is how the resistance physically look like. These are the resistors inside. These are the resistors that we have. We go uh, this way to increase their, uh, their value and, and their, their path to increase the value of the resistance. But here you have now all these points will have different potential. And this is a high voltage. And each point will have a different voltage. This is V1, this is V2, this is V3, and so on and so forth. Okay, so you will have a lot of straight capacitors. So impulse voltages cannot be measured using such uh, an instrument. Now, I will take a small break here, like five minutes, and uh, we, will, we will continue. So I pause recording. Okay, now the most common way to measure high voltage is using voltage dividers. That is the most common way in high voltage labs is to use the voltage dividers. Yes, the other techniques I mentioned is mentioned, it's used here and there, mainly for calibration purposes, but the most important one is to use voltage dividers. And voltage divider, as I mentioned earlier, in principle, it's the same as the low voltage dividers that we use in circuit courses. It's exactly the same principle. So basically here we have two arms, a high impedance arm and a low impedance arm. And they are connected in series, okay? And of course, to, uh, to have this in series, the current here that goes to the instrumentation has to be almost equal to, uh, equal to zero. And this is why we, when we connect our oscilloscope, we have to connect the oscilloscope at a very high input impedance, the mega ohm impedance, okay? Usually there are two modes when you uh, connect your oscilloscope. The, you select, especially for the sophisticated one, you select either uh, the uh, characteristic impedance of the cables to be your input impedance of your, uh, of your oscilloscope or the mega ohm values. So if you do a high voltage measurement, you have to use the mega ohm measurement. If you are using the oscilloscope to measure, for example, uh, through an antenna, then you, you want to have a sort of a match, uh, a, a matching between the impedance, the characteristic impedance of the oscilloscope and your antenna to avoid reflections. So use the 50 ohm. Okay, so these are the two setups. So for, for high voltage, we select the input impedance of the of our scope, so it's going to be a very, very high value so that the currents that go into becomes extremely small, almost zero. And then these two resistors will be in series. So the current I here is almost equal to the current there. Okay. And then you can apply voltage, voltage division principle. Otherwise, if you use the, our oscilloscope at the 50 ohm impedance, then you will have a huge voltage drop across your oscilloscope. Okay, so this is just a, a sort of a, a side a side note. Now those impedances could be resistors, could be capacitors, or could be combinations, and that make the uh, voltage divider can classified in two different types: resistive voltage dividers, capacitive voltage divider, and mixed voltage divider. These are the three different types, and each one basically. Uh, you will have uh, for each one have certain applications that we will uh, discuss. Now, for the measurement here, you would mainly we use an oscilloscope, but sometimes we use voltmeter to get the, the, the reading. Now, to have a good high accurate divider that the high and the low impedance should have should vary at the same percentage. Because I, once you start to have a current going here, again, there will be some heating effect because of the I square R. 
Okay. Now, the coefficient of in, or the increase in the resistance of the high impedance and the low impedance subjected to this current should be the same so that your formula for the voltage uh, divider will not be uh, affected. Now, let's start with the resistor divider. So, basically, resistor divider means that your uh, resistance, the, uh, the impedance that we have here, the high impedance and the low impedance, R1 and R2 are basically uh, the resistors. And this is mainly used for AC and DC uh, high voltage uh, measurement. And this is your oscilloscope here. This is the input impedance of your uh, oscilloscope. And here you will have the, your uh, coaxial uh, cable to connect to your, uh, to your oscilloscope. And the V output is equal to V1 R2 over R, R1. Now, this is how physically the resistive, uh, this is the high voltage arm of the resistor because we have here R1 and R2. R1 is the high voltage. R2 is the low voltage uh, or sorry, the low value resistance or the low voltage resistance across which we measure your, your low voltage. So this is, if you look here, uh, these resistors, uh, they are fitted on a plexiglass and you see here those spheres, those basically at the connection point. So these resistors are in series here and those, those uh, uh, sort of uh, spheres is to uh, make the electric field to, to uh, basically uh, make the field uniform, sort of uniform, avoid any sharp points here, avoid any arcing at the connection points between those uh, resistors. So that's something very important because uh, when you design uh, a voltage divider for high voltage, you have to make sure that there is no arcing because of the high voltage that you uh, you apply. And the low uh, voltage resistance will be something at, at the bottom here. Now, this is uh, the uh, circuit or the stray capacitance that you will have when you apply the resistive uh, divider. So basically you have self and mutual stray capacitance as we would, as we uh, discuss them in details here, okay? Now, if we use these dividers to, for impulse measurement, then the self and stray capacitance of the divider should be considered. Now we have, now wh why is that? Because ZC basically as a magnitude is equal to one over omega C. Okay. Now, if you have this under DC, okay, your omega is zero. So this is an infinity, so it's like an open circuit. But once you start to have an impulse, you will have a very high frequency here. Very high frequency, so you will have here a fine. C is very small. This is very high, so you will have a, a considerable impedance here or a capacitor, capacitive impedance. Then it will impact because it will start to use some of the currents and it will have some of the voltage induced there. So that will impact your measurement. So we have to be very careful when it comes to the uh, impulse measurement. Now, the self capacitance, basically C prime B, okay. This is the capacitance across each resistance. So each of those resistance, because the voltage here and the voltage across it are different, okay? Because you, you will have a voltage drop. So V1 here and V2 there. So you have two voltages, okay? Across which there is a dielectric material. So basically here you will have a capacitance. Between each of those resistors, we have what we call the cell these are the self capacitance. And then there is the stray capacitance, which is between the connection and the high voltage. So between every connection and the, this is the high voltage, this is the ground, okay? So between the high voltage, between the, uh, every uh, connection and the high voltage, so this is C prime H. So you, this is connection and the high voltage, this connection and the high voltage, so you will have all those stray capacitance C prime H, or between the high voltage and the ground, you will have the C L or C E. So you will have here a lot of stray capacitance self and stray capacitance. Now, as you might imagine, finding these values are extremely difficult. 
because it depends on what is the exact location of your uh, divider with respect to the surrounding environment. So that is something you don't have control over. So these values keep on changing. So it's very hard to, uh, to actually uh, estimate those stray uh, uh, capacitors. And basically this simplified model is only valid for short divider, when you have relatively short. Now, once you start to increase the divider, the stray capacitors become even much, much more complicated. So it, this will make even the uh, stray capacitors harder to be used for impulse. So what do we use for impulse? One way, if you want to measure voltages 200 kilovolt or below, we use this divider as per the IEEE standard uh, four, and it's mentioned in page one, 117. So that divider is specifically used for impulse voltages, but a small uh, values, not more than uh, 200 kilovolt. Yeah. Now, because this is the overall dimensions here is small, as you can see, because it's only used to measure 200 kilovolt, not more than that. Then the stray capacitance are, are low, and we can use this divider to do this, uh, these measurements. Now, the estimated stray uh, capacitance here is around 20 picofarad per meter. So for this small type of capacitors, the time constant is around 75 nanoseconds. This is a very, very short period of time that the, uh, the time uh, that it will, or the effect or the error that you will have in the measurement. So if you measure 1.2 microsecond rise time, and this is 75 nanoseconds, which is 0 0.075 microsecond. So the error it can induce is not that large in this type of, uh, of, of divider. So the time constant is small, and this can be used to measure the, the impulse, uh, impulse waves. Question is, what if I want to measure higher voltages, or if I want to measure uh, higher impulse voltages, or even high AC? The resistive dividers are basically limited to a few hundred of kilovolt, 100 kilovolt, 200 kilovolt AC. That's it. Uh, for DC, yes, they can be used, as I said, because for DC, the stray capacitance acts like an open circuit. There is no issue. But if you want to use this for AC, and definitely for uh, impulse, you cannot use that. Now, also for AC, now if you use uh, a resistive, uh, once you have higher and higher voltages, you will have higher and higher current, and that would also impact the accuracy. So to avoid these problems, we use basically the capacitive divider. So here the two arms, instead of using the resistance, we are using capacitance, okay? And now when we select the value of the capacitance high enough, then all the stray capacitance will have no influence. Because the divider itself is made from capacitance and we select the values to be large enough that the impact of all stray capacitance can be neglected. So that is one of the advantages of using the capacitive divider that you can modify the impact of the of the stray uh, capacitance. Now, how they look like? This is like a coaxial capacitor. So let's have a look here. So here, this is the high voltage basically here. Or here it is the high voltage. So this dome is the high voltage. And you can see here now, once you start working high voltage, you have to have a large radius. You have to have a small surface. Why? To avoid any shear point to avoid any sort of arcing or corona on the surface of the, of the capacitor. Now, number two is the low voltage electrode with garden. So number two here, so it's a, like a coaxial inside. And this is the outside, this is the high voltage, and this is the, the low voltage inside. Okay, so this is number one is your high voltage. Number two, okay, is your uh, low voltage. Now here, number three is your supporting tube to support your low voltage uh, side of the capacitors. And outside this is actually an insulating uh, cylinder. And uh, finally, number four is the 
coaxial connection that you have here and you take it to your to your measurement uh, system so that is this standard capacitor is used for dissipation factor measurement we will talk about the dissipation factor measurement when we talk about non intrusive testing for the high voltage uh, equipment so that is basically uh, the capacitor bank or sorry the capacitor divider that you use for these uh, measurements now the capacitance is between coil one and two as i mentioned this is the high voltage this is the low voltage so that is the the capacitance between the, the two now we use an sf6 gas pressurized of course as an insulating medium between the two so that we can reduce the size and there will be no flash over happening and here is the value of c per unit length is 2 pi epsilon ln r2 over r1 r2 and r1 are the external and the internal uh, radius and r2 over r1 is basically we use it as equal to e and this will give you 56 picofarad per per column per meter sorry now the final one is the mixed rc divider here we we mix between the r and the c so we have a c, the c resistance and the resistance for both the low the high and the low voltage on so we use a mix between the two okay so the capacitance divider at low frequency okay so act as a capacitance divider at low frequency and the resistive divider for fast transients as the capacitors become small at these high uh, frequencies so these mixed type of divider are ideal if you, for example you want to measure the ribbon on the dc supplies as the capacitance in series with the resistance will block the dc uh, component now this is at, at our high voltage lab uh, these are the dividers that we have so for example this is the 400 kilovolt test transformer we use capacitive divider we don't use a resistive divider here we use capacitive because the voltage is very high if it is 100 kilovolt or lower then we, would, we could use a resistive divider for the dc supply here we use a resistive divider this is a resistive divider used at our 300 this is a 300 kilovolt dc supply this is 400 kilovolt uh, test transformer now for the impulse well this is, we have very high frequencies so here we are using a mixed type of the divider so that it can help us to uh, extract the transients that happen on the uh, on the on the impulse finally we'll talk about the current measurement now in many times we need to measure high currents okay so how to measure those currents there are different ways one way to measure the current basically in any circuit of course we don't use uh, here uh, a meter to measure those high currents because you need to have very 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 expensive that can handle kilo amps i'm not sure if some, some such thing is really exist so one way to measure the high current is to have a shunt resistance in the in the path of the current and you measure the voltage across the resistance so this could be your device your, you have here the current i so the current i will produce a voltage drop here and you measure that voltage doing the value of the resistance then you can find the, the current now it depends on the value of the current you select different sizes of the resistance to dissipate the high temperature coming out of those uh, of those high high currents also we use a rojoski coil to measure high transient currents okay so those coils so basically it's a current transformer but the core is made from air and because we have air there is no saturation so what do we mean by that what do we mean by saturation uh, let, let me just uh, go a bit away from here let me explain this to you what do we mean by saturation and why this is different than regular transformer and what we mean by saturation here. So basically in transformers, regular transformers, that we have the core here, the core is made from silicon steel. Okay, so we have here the primary, this is B primary, and here your B secondary. Now we use here magnetic material. One of the most common material we use for transformer 
is silicon steel. Now, what is a magnetic material? What makes a magnetic material a magnetic material? If you look under the microscope of those magnetic material, they are made from dipoles. So for example, here you will have dipoles, okay, north, south, north, south. And if you don't apply an external current or voltage across them, these are random, okay? So the net magnetic field around them is zero. Now, if you have a magnet, those dipoles are aligned, so you have a net magnetic field around them. But magnetic material, they have these dipoles, but they are random. Now, once you apply a voltage, you will start to align those dipoles. Okay? And here we have what we call the DH curve. Okay, so this is your H, and this is your B, flux density. The flux divided by the cross-section area. And the flux density goes like this until it saturates here. Now, H basically is N times I divided by L. Now, the most important thing is the current. So as you increase the current, you are increasing the flux. Why? Because you, you, have, you apply more current, you have more alignment of those dipoles. You increase the current, you have more alignment, you have more flux. Because once you align them more, you have more net flux until you reach to the saturation level. Then any further increase in the current, you don't have any increase in the flux. Why? Because you already aligned most of those dipoles. So that's what we call saturation. And saturation happens only in magnetic material. But air doesn't have those dipoles, so air cannot saturate. Now, what does this, how this will impact the frequency? Now, in transformers, basically we use it for 60 hertz. Now, this is another thing. This is the current magnitude, saturation, but also the frequency can cause saturation. So, if you have very, very fast currents, then you will not be able to align the dipoles, okay? Because the dipoles can only interact with certain frequency. Otherwise, they will not be able to, to do that. So this is why the transformers that we use, usually they are good up to 300 hertz. If you try to induce voltages higher than 300 hertz, you cannot, because the dipoles cannot react to those high, 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 high pulses or high frequencies. Then we have to use different core material. Okay? And there are different core material when, whenever you want to measure high frequency currents, and one of them is to use an air, an air core. So air does not saturate, and it does respond to these high, uh, high frequencies. Okay, so let's go back here now. Okay, so we use the Rojowski coil as a current transformer, okay? And because we use air, we have no, uh, no saturation. So as we know that the output of the uh, this is the primary of the ct and this is the secondary current of it okay so we use an integrator any type of conditioning circuit an amplifier integrator whatever we want to do to get our our uh, our signal back there and your v out is m di by dt so when you take the integration of the signal here okay we I mean with an amplifier then you can get that the current in the from your your signal so those type of Rojowski coils can be used to measure basically the high uh, frequency uh, components. And usually we use them to measure the high current. Uh, for example, lightning currents. We, we have them, for example, in CN Tower, we have some of those huge coils to measure those high, uh, high currents. So this is uh, this is uh, some of those coils, okay, and this is at the ground part of the uh, of uh, tower. So measure if there's any fault, high fault currents can be can be actually measured through those uh, those coils. And as I said, we call it Rojowski coil. This is the name of the inventor of who came up with those with this coil. Finally, what are the things that we have to pay attention? And your test laboratory when you do with 
uh, measurements. First of all, you need to keep your dividers away from the walls or any ground equipment. And now we understand that why, because of the impact of the stray capacitance. Uh, we have seen in the sphere gaps, you have to maintain certain distance for it, uh, radius B, that you cannot have anything between the spheres and uh, or any ob object between that radius and and the spheres. And same thing for the for the divider. Also, it's very important to make the divider very close from the testing object to reduce the connection and ductance. You don't want to have the uh, test object far away from the divider, and then you connect a long, long wire, then you have high inductance, which will have an impact on your, in your measurement. Also, you want to have the divider very close to the high voltage supply, okay? Now, if you, uh, if you have, now the question, you have here a supply, this is your supply, okay? And here is your, your load, okay? And you apply the high voltage, okay? To your to your load and there is some connection now where i want to have my uh, divider do i have it here close to here to this capacitive divider or there so if i have it there i'm measuring the supply voltage rather than the voltage at the load itself which what well, this is what i want actually i want to know how much voltage is not coming from the supply but how much voltage is coming at the test object. So we want to have the divider as close as possible so that we measure that the voltage is at the, the, uh, the load. If you want to measure the voltage at the supply itself, then you have to have the divider close to the, to the supply. Also, there is some EM radiations. Whenever there is uh, impulse or if there is uh, any fault happens, then there will be an electromagnetic radiation coming out of those poles. Now, those electromagnetic radiations can interact with your measuring devices and they can cause problems. And this is why electromagnetic compatibility is something very, very important in, in this context. Otherwise, you can damage completely your devices, not that only in the lab, but on the vicinity of the lab. You could have computers in the other rooms Okay, if there is no proper shielding, then you could damage all these equipment. So it's very, very important that when you do flashover test, when you have impulse test, then you have to watch the EM radiations from any electron. Now, at, this is an old system when you have everything is shielded inside uh, that room. Okay, so you keep, this is like a cache to avoid anything. Now in our lab, you don't have to, to do this now because the, now most of the equipment have this uh, EM or electromagnetic compatibility, EMC compliance, okay? So the device itself now is shielded, okay? So you cannot use any normal oscilloscope for impulse measurement, for example. You have to have an oscilloscope that is uh, actually EMC compatible. Uh, also the lab itself, all the walls, and we have that, in our lab is completely shielded. So if there's anything happens, it will not impact any office in uh, around around the high voltage uh, high voltage lab. So that's what I want to talk about uh, measurement. It's, uh, uh, it's very quick view about the different techniques we use to measure mainly high voltages, either AC, DC, or impulse, and also some of the consideration we have to be attention when we measure the, uh, the current.